Order, order. Welcome to this morning's session of the Select Committee on the Department of Business and Trade. And we are holding an evidence session this morning as part of our inquiry on industrial policy. And specifically, we're looking at the opportunities for the UK around industrial policy and the transition um, to net zero. Um, so, Cameron, maybe I could start with you. Could you just tell us, is the transition to net zero good for jobs in Britain? I think that's a fairly low-ball, uh, easy question. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, it's nice to be here. The, um, it's very clear that there's a net increase in jobs. Mm. So un unless you've got an overheated economy with too much employment and you're worried about inflation, uh, this transition is going to create jobs. Now, um, there's a lot of nuance in uh, that answer. So I think we will have a paper coming out within the next week that looks at, uh, actually calculates jobs created, 250,000 in total, 150,000 direct, 100,000 indirect. There's a wider range of estimates from the Committee on Climate Change, which I think uh, varies from 135 to just over 700,000 jobs. So the, the ranges are wide. What's clear and has been clear now for a decade is that there's net job creation. That's partly because as you move from an economy that requires more uh, material inputs to one in which you're using the sun and the wind and, and you're more efficient about how you do things, uh, there's more need and scope for, for the labour side. And in particular, the, the transition itself involves a scale-up. Uh, we might call them capital expenditure-related jobs to build it out. Mm. Uh, we have another unpublished study looking at US power system jobs where, where you get this burst of 600,000 jobs to transition the US power system to net zero by 2035, falling back down to 200,000 of steady state uh, jobs. So this is, there's good and bad here. Uh, the good is that if you want jobs, uh, you're going to get them. Uh, the bad is that several decades in, some of those jobs are going to fade away as the, as the build slows down and, uh, and people return to having well, to do well, other things. Um, tell me a bit more about these jobs. How well paid are they going to be? Uh, so where, where are they going to be? Right, great question. Yep, super. Um, so the, the evidence is mixed on how well they're going to be paid. Um, mm. There's some suggestion that on average they'll be less well paid than uh, equivalent gap, uh, jobs in the oil and gas sector. They're less risky on average, uh, so there's less of a premium. Um, but there's equally some evidence that suggests these are higher tech jobs that um, you so, so I'm not sure I can give you a clear answer on, on average wages. And that's because uh, we don't know. It's because I don't know at this point. I, I'm does, sure it is. Does anybody know? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. But I, but I think these. I mean, we're projecting, so we could mm. we could we can and do do studies to try and pin mm. pin these sort of numbers down, or at least you know wage differentials down. Uh, but but I, but I'm not going to sit here with confidence say there will be 10 percent average increase in wages or whatever. Yeah. In in the debate on artificial intelligence, there's now a lot of um, argumentation and a lot of analysis about how this is basically going to bifurcate the jobs market, and that many jobs will be automated, and therefore low skilled jobs will potentially suffer lower wages, whereas the returns to capital and the returns to uh, high skilled jobs will probably rise, and therefore there could be this new inequality in the jobs market. Are you anxious about any kinds of trends like that? Uh, yes, and um, <clears throat> it was research at Oxford that kicked off the uh, global anxiety about this issue, and saying 47% of jobs will be destroyed by AI. Um, I think while you present a um, certainly more nuanced picture than all the jobs are going to go there, it's perhaps even more nuanced than that. Um, there are certainly some... I, mean, I think the key question is the automatability mm -hmm. of jobs. So there are some currently high-skilled jobs that a computer can do, or not a computer, a, a, a generalised uh, or an artificial intelligent machine can do just as well. Uh, for instance, I've seen in my own... This is anecdotal evidence, but in my own uh, um, personal life, you know, corporate life, uh, coders are quite easy to replace, mm. it turns out. And um, GPT uh, 3 and 4 actually enable, if you need to fire people, uh, it's the coders that you can get rid mm. of. Now, these are previously thought of as very high-skilled jobs. But in the transition to net zero, are you basically saying that there will be winners and losers? 
There will be winners and losers, that's absolutely clear. And will the winners outweigh the losers? Yes, we expect so. With, with be more winners really than high losers. Confidence. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then which are the sectors, which are the parts of the economy that will be most jobs rich as a result of the transition to a lower carbon economy? Yeah, so I mean, the big changes come uh, to. I mean, this is this is not very granular, but uh, energy sector, uh, industry, buildings, and transport. They're the four big ones that will be changed by the net zero transition. Of course, you know, in a sense, the whole economy is affected, but they're the four major sectors. Uh, we see, I think, job creation net in all of those sectors globally. Now, of course. As you say, winners and losers. How well does the UK car industry fare? Um, it's doing its best. Uh, I, you know, were things different uh, in 2010 when the Chinese were aggressively seeking advice about how to build out an EV industry? I was rebuffed uh, by car industries in Europe uh, and here where there was limited interest uh, saying that this is going to happen much further down the line. Um, now, you know, we're here now. So one, yeah. one of the features about, and perhaps we'll come on to this later, but one of the features about industrial competitiveness is that it's path dependent and there's clustering effects and uh, you know, it, it, there are opportunities that come and if you miss them, they're gone. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the UK car industry uh, has missed the opportunity, but it's now um, racing, I guess, to, to catch up. So there'll be some sectors w which are going to create a lot of jobs, and it sounds like that they're non-internationally <coughs> traded sectors by and large. Is that fair? Uh, I th yes. I mean, many, most of those are not internationally traded. Yeah, okay. I mean, so I mean, there'll, there'll, there'll be some sectors that become almost sunset industries, mm -hmm. perhaps, and then it sounds like that there will be some sectors which are potentially in peril, but could grow. That's right. And, and I mean, if, if... And you'd put automotive in that bracket, would you? Certainly in peril, and certainly the space is, is transitioning very quickly, and um, the UK's had a historic set of comparative advantages there, and as we know from Penny Mealy and Alexander Tittleboim's work, uh, countries tend to be able to move to adjacent spaces from a space where they have an advantage. So can we build on that ex uh, advantage? Uh, it's a reasonable case. The case against is that actually an EV is a very different vehicle from an internal combustion engine. You're, you need comparative advantage in battery packs and the kit around that and in software, whereas in an internal combustion engine vehicle, it's about the ball, the ball bearings and the gearing and the combustion chambers and so on. So it's a different bit of kit, perhaps. So do we need an industrial strategy to help us capitalise on potential transition to net zero? Uh, yes, I, uh, to to put this one way, which I think will be um, enlightening, if you go back sixty or seventy years and look at, say, South Korea, and say, let's leave it to the market for them to specialise in their area of comparative advantage. Well, they would be a world leading exporter of rice right now, not of the Samsung phones that are in your pockets and the cars that we drive around. And I think. Um, I think it is welcome that we've had a return to thinking more strategically about the country uh, and about industrial policy. It's necessary for net zero, but I would argue that um, the state is always... You don't want the state to be intervening very directly and picking winning firms. I mean, that, that's a recipe for picking losers. But you do need an overarching strategic uh, direction where those in charge are thinking about how to direct resources to to build and enhance uh, and move uh, from one area of comparative advantage to another. And that's what the East Asians have done so well, and I dare say we haven't done so well in recent decades. Um, Hannah, can I ask you, um, you might just say a, a word about the investors group that you help steward, um, but can you tell us, do you think investors in this country want to invest in the transition to net zero? Thank you very much, Chair, and I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the ABI, which represents more than 300 firms across the UK's insurance and long-term savings industry. Uh, and you mentioned our investment delivery forum, and that's a new initiative that we mobilised last summer in order to capitalise on the regulatory reforms that are being introduced through Solvency UK. And essentially what Solvency UK will do is enable insurers to invest in a broader range of productive assets than was previously the case. Uh, and we believe that this has the potential to unlock 100 billion of investment over the next decade in green and good projects. In Britain? 
in Britain, exactly. We oh, want to make... Sorry, Look, just, this is a more one. You think the group you represent has got available £100 billion to invest in Britain? We have pledged £100 billion and we want to make that investment in green and good infrastructure across the UK. And to act as a catalyst, the forum was mobilised with seven of the largest of a our ABI members. They are Aviva, Rothsay, M&G, Phoenix Group, Lloyds Banking Group, Royal London and Just Group. All of those businesses want to invest in the UK. The forum has identified a number of barriers. These are not new barriers, unfortunately. They're long-standing barriers, but we want to work together with all stakeholders, government, bodies such as 3CI, the Green Finance Institute and beyond, to see can we find mechanisms through which we can actually unlock this investment potential. So to give you a sense of some of the recommendations that we've put forward, and I'd be very happy to submit to the committee our paper that we published uh, earlier this year with a suite of mm. policy recommendations, we think the first thing is Solvency UK has to be implemented. That looks to be on track for the end of this year. We also need to um, see faster decisions coming from governments and that those decisions are committed to for the long term. That's a message uh, that was in the National Infrastructure Commission's paper that came out last week and it certainly resonated with my experience through the forum. What we've, what we've discussed... Sorry, what kind of decisions? I mean, government makes zillions of decisions every day. What are the decisions you're worried about? <clears throat> well, we've seen sometimes reversals of policy mm -hmm. decisions or last-minute changes to policies such as the heat policy, mm -hmm. which then led to less incentive to invest in heat pumps, for example. Mm -hmm. We would like there to be a long-term approach. That's, that's the critical mm. ask from our industry. If you think about the nature of insurers and long-term investors' businesses, we are investing for many decades. These are people's pensions that we're talking about. And the regulatory framework means that we need to see a steady, predictable rate of return across a long time period. And what, what the forum has identified is there's a problem around the supply of investable projects. Mm -hmm. um, we are working quite intensively with a lot of stakeholders to identify where might there be opportunities to invest across three areas, energy generation, energy networks and transport. But alongside that, we also need to see... Um, a long-term approach coming from government. It's done some good work. We think the um, powering up Britain and the net zero strategy are great, great foundations, but really what we'd like to see is a national transition plan supported by sector-specific strategies that set out a clear roadmap with milestones so that investors know what investment is needed when. Okay, so um, whose money is it these people are investing? The, the companies I've mentioned are serving customers right across the right across the country. They are okay. UK policyholders and savers. So this is British savers, basically. <coughs> so they're, they're, yes. they're stewarding money from British long-term savers. That's correct. Okay. And they are confident that they want to invest this money in the transition to net zero? We have committed as an industry. Uh, in 2021, the ABI published our climate change roadmap, which sets out a series of actions for the industry to get to net zero. Yeah. But you're, you're raising an interesting question, Chair, and I wonder where you're trying to take this is to do with the fundamental objective of these businesses is to deliver a good rate of return for the savers. Mm. Yeah. That is the primary and, and obligation. Because they're not investing right now, presumably that rate of return isn't currently available today. They are already investing. What the changes to the regulatory framework will allow is them to invest in a broader range of productive assets. Um, we are exploring opportunities for different types of co-investment model. Yep. So um, that would enable us to find a way of smoothing the risk at the start of a project so that insurers might be able to contribute. Okay, I've, I've just got one more before I hand over to Jane um, Hun. Um, so you said there were three sectors there that were being prioritised, energy, energy networks and transport. That is a different list to Cameron's list of where the big job numbers are going to be and in particular, what's missing is buildings. Um, well, we, we're looking at housing as well, but I would say that that um, is, is quite a broad sector. We have identified some challenges in terms of the retrofitting model, but we are partnering with a number of organisations such as 3CI to see can we come up with investment models mm. that would enable retrofitting at scale. Mm. 
There is a project underway at the moment. Lloyds Banking Group is involved with 3CI, um, West Yorkshire Combined Authority, Octopus Energy, to see can they come up with an investment model that would enable them to invest in retrofitting at scale. Um, and we are looking at building uh, buildings in the round. We, you were asking earlier about jobs. I think from our perspective, we see that there's a big opportunity uh, for job creation through the transition to net zero. But what is needed is consideration of the skills that are required in order to get us there. Mm -hmm. One of our suggestions has been looking at the construction industry training board levy mm -hmm. to make sure that the scope of that levy covers the occupations that are going to be needed in the future to build the sustainable and energy efficient homes that that we all want. Um, and the apprenticeship levy transfer is, is another area that might be leveraged to help with that. Absolutely right. Thank you very much, Chair. So um, this has been classed as the uh, net zero, that is, as the economic opportunity of the 21st century. And I'm just wondering if that's true. So, so I'm going to try and challenge you um, on it, if that's OK. So the £100 billion investment uh, sounds very exciting as a long-term approach. Um, however, um, I'm concerned that because we're going for 2050, but other countries are going for a later date, that actually, in terms of productivity, we might actually lose some of that production within the UK because uh, instead of doing that investment, taking that investment up in the UK, they will simply transfer those jobs and that production to another country that doesn't need to hit net zero until, say, 20 years onwards. Um, what do you think about that, Hannah? Well, I think competition for investment is certainly intensifying globally. Um, we've seen measures such as the US Inflation Reduction Act and the EU Green Deal and Capitals Mobile. It will go where it can find the best balance of risk and return. What I can say on behalf of the members that I represent is that we are committed through the Investment Delivery Forum to try and find those opportunities for investment in the UK uh, in green and good projects and also working collaboratively with government at all levels of government and other stakeholders to see can we find ways to accelerate the infrastructure development that we need. And given we've got low productivity, generally speaking, in the UK in comparison to other countries, do you think this is really an opportunity for us then? I do believe it's an opportunity. It's a huge shift for us all as a society and an economy, but it's absolutely critical if we are going to achieve the net zero targets that the government has committed to. As an industry, we really want to play our part. We think we play a key enabling role, and I would say on behalf of uh, the insurance sector, um, we have an important role both as an investor but also as a risk enabler. So on the insurance side, we can also help to insure projects so that um, they can have more confidence in the delivery and execution, which in turn can increase investor appetite for those, for those projects. Thank you. So Cameron, do you think the, the balance is about right for the UK because it gives us an opportunity to do something about productivity that we've not been able to do for a long, long time? Uh, and do you think that will actually happen or will there simply be almost a lazy shift to other countries? Well, I certainly don't think we should be going any slower. Uh, and if anything, the concern I would have, uh, rather than because other countries are moving um, you know, have 2060 targets like uh, yeah, you know, perhaps China um, that they're attracting the investment. I, th I think in a sense the concern really is the opposite. Um, Hannah mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act in the US in the, f in the year after that it was uh, passed. We've seen $224 billion already flow in from private capital into investment because investors are seeing that this is a huge opportunity for future returns. Um, and I would add, actually, the key thing is the risk-adjusted return. So you don't mind making a modest return if you know that the policy framework is clear and your risks are, are minimised. And I think, in a sense, that the challenge that we've had in this country, perhaps in recent uh, years, is that the risk associated with the returns that one might hope to achieve is a little too high. So I'd focus on reducing the risk as much as raising the returns. I think in terms of the opportunity to correct our lagging productivity, you know, since the global financial crisis, we've been, uh, total factor productivity has been increasing at about 0.7% per annum. Before that was 2.1%. If we'd increased at the rates that we had historically been increasing our productivity by every person in the, every, every uh, person in the UK would be more than 10,000 pounds better off. So this is, this is a big deal. Can net zero help? Yes. Uh, can it do all the burden of raising UK productivity? No. Uh, I mean, the fundamental challenge is that we undersave in this country. 
uh, our savings, net national savings rate uh, at the bottom of the OECD or near the bottom of the OECD tables in between Greece and Portugal, if I remember correctly, and a very long way off the Norwegians and the Swiss and the Taiwanese and the South Koreans. And our investment levels lag. I mean, we're a full, I think, 4% of GDP below G7 levels in investment. Until recently, that was a mix of both public and private investment. Very recently, the public investment has risen, so it's now, as much as anything, a private investment story. So, so getting the suite of policies that can direct Hannah's group and others to think, I, I, I have a look at the UK, I can see a good risk-adjusted return here, I'm going to pile in. That is now, I think, top priority of business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Douglas Chairman. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I, I'm actually quite interested in how this might affect regional policy across the UK. Uh, and I just want to report from your perspective, what are the big opportunities to improve productivity? Uh, you know, for example, outside the, the Golden Triangle and, and, and the southeast of, of England, for example. You know, how do we actually try and... I know the government are trying to level up, but this seems like a ideal opportunity to level up some of the uh, communities that have been countries that will be left behind uh, in you know, the growth and in, in economic activity in, in the UK. So what, what's your view on how we might be able to do that? Um, so my view is that it is indeed an opportunity. We're not going to be building vast arrays of offshore wind farms in London. Uh, nor are we going to be building hydrogen storage units uh, at scale in M25, nor carbon capture there. But that is where a lot of the capital and the jobs has to flow. Not, not that location, but in those sectors, in those activities. They are naturally, sensibly, going to be in places that will contribute to levelling up. And if I might just take a, a, a perhaps a step back and say one of the main drivers of productivity gains, this is work we have underway at Oxford, not yet published, is how efficiently we're able to use, to reduce costs, uh, to reduce our energy costs, which we expect to happen as you move towards a cheaper, cleaner energy system, but also how efficiently we use that energy. You know, at the moment, we pay foreign countries vast amounts of money. In 2022, it was over £100 billion to import their fossil fuels and then pump them into our houses that are inefficiently insulated and the money just simply goes out the roof, out the windows, and we wonder why we're not a productive economy. Getting those costs down economy-wide will increase the competitiveness of existing industries in the north uh, of England and outside the, the Golden Triangle, which, which has smaller but... Uh, why economy-wide effects on the UK's competitiveness at the global scale. So I'd say there are those two sectors. One is a concentrated focus on building out the industries that we need in places that aren't London, and the other is a broader economy-wide um, productivity effect. And do you feel that the current government's policy uh, and strategy is sufficient to actually support <coughs> that as well in terms of you know, like um, resilience in terms of infrastructure, or is that coming, uh, or is it coming too slow? And uh, are we having the sufficient skills uh, at the moment to actually take advantage of some of these opportunities? Uh, so, uh, we, we we've had a we, we've had a mixed record, I think, uh, on this space. And uh, you know, if I'm being completely honest, I think we're we're not we're not on track either to meet the the targets that we have. And nor is the current levels of investment or work and skills what ideally it would be, given the transformation of the economy that we're moving towards now. But that doesn't mean we can't fix these problems. And what's your view on the, the, the regional levelling up thing for a start? Certainly we see this as an opportunity for a just transition and we want to uh, find a way that all communities can benefit. One practical challenge that we've identified is the level of skills and capability. It's not consistent across different regions and we are therefore calling for bodies such as the Royal Town Planning Institute to help train more planning officers so that those you've got a, a more skilled workforce that can get the planning applications approved more quickly. Um, there's also a challenge around the ability to prepare investment cases that 
meet the needs of institutional investors. Again, there's inconsistency across different regions. We would like to find a way to help tackle that um, because the alternative is that you will end up in a situation where certain regions, Manchester would be an obvious one, they've simply got a lot more muscle memory in terms of developing those investment cases and can present a more credible case more quickly to institutional investors. Okay. Um, just, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, Scotland as well, because it's obviously we've got quite a lot of offshore wind, for example, uh, that we can utilise from there. I just wonder what the, um, you know, how you would view that in terms of, you know, being a, a major powerhouse for the UK and how we could take advantage of that particular situation and whether there's sufficient investment going in now to actually provide not just the jobs but that level of activity, uh, you know, not really seeing on the ground any, um, like, uh, you know, turbines and things being built in Scotland. Uh, and I just wondered if, in terms of, I mean, we're just back from the States as well, and we've been looking at their industrial policy and all sorts of things and how there's protections within agreements. I just wondered if that's something that you would agree with as well in terms of should there be a certain percentage of uh, build that is within contracts and so on to make sure that the jobs and the activity does come to uh, the North East, comes to Scotland, comes to other, uh, Wales, for example, other parts of the UK that would actually benefit from this uh, opportunity. Well, in, in terms of um, your question around whether there should be anything contractually around the regions or geographies where certain materials should be manufactured, I'll leave that to Professor Hepburn, I think, if that's OK. But just in terms of the opportunity for Scotland, there's a huge opportunity for Scotland. If you look at PwC's green barometer, it says that across the UK, they estimate for every one green job, 1.4 green jobs will be created. But if you look in Scotland, that multiplies <coughs> up to about six six jobs or thereabouts. And of course, the UK has really led the way in offshore fixed wind, and that creates a big opportunity for us to um, lead the way on offshore floating wind. Um, one of the things that we're doing through the forum is working with the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, to see if we can develop models to enable insurers to put, uh, put forward some of that upfront initial investment that's needed in the port infrastructure that's absolutely critical to enabling the deployment of offshore floating wind. Um, and I should say that the chair of um, the SNIB, Willie Watt, he is a member of our advisory panel that we convene to help inform the work of the forum. So there's a big opportunity for Scotland on offshore floating wind and fixed. And just finally, Professor. Yeah, so um, I'm going to come at your question slightly obliquely uh, and say, uh, slightly nerdily, and, and say that if we had a power system that priced um, power more regionally, as, say, the Texans do, then what you would find is that electricity would be a lot cheaper in Scotland because there is excess supply, there's cheap wind, the more to come. And if you found that electricity were cheaper in Scotland, it would make sense to then relocate other downstream energy intensive industries to where the energy is cheap. Now I think that is a change that we might see coming, in, one can hope, from the way in which the, the grid is being reorganised to deal with the net zero future. It makes sense for all sorts of economic reasons to price things sensibly where they should be and it, it would advantage Scotland. In terms of local content requirements and um, contractual, you know, obviously this is the sort of thing that, you know, in principle, it would be better if the world as a whole didn't do these sorts of things. But the world does do these sorts of things, and we see it in all sorts of countries for good, understandable, strategic reasons. So I don't think um, ideology should necessarily get in the way of thinking strategically about which industries you want to sensibly ensure are at least partially located locally in Scotland, near to where the action is happening. That could be part of an industrial policy for the whole of the UK. Potentially, yeah. Yep. Right, can, I, can I just check, Cameron, from your point of view, do you know where the jobs could be created? Have you got a kind of a geographical view of where those jobs might lie? Um, I'm uh, afraid to say that we've got very good spatial uh, forecasts of jobs and where they're being created in the US right now. Okay. That's, that's the data set that we've been yeah. working on. It's quite interesting. We, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, 
well, at least the, the, t the team that I see uh, who has yeah. this work in progress isn't, doesn't have that in the UK. Okay, so that's it, a gap. I'm just, because it's a gap. If, it should if, be doable, if, if, though. If, if Hannah says there's a capability gap in different parts of the country, it would be useful to know whether the capability gap is actually in the same place as the job growth potential. Yep. Um, but we can come back to that. Andy McDonald. <clears throat> uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, fascinating evidence thus far. Thank you. Um, I just want to look at... Um, just this immensely competitive environment there is now for uh, net zero technologies and I think you've already touched upon that to a large degree um, I think I'm, uh, did, did you say it was 224 billion has been levered in yes uh, uh, for, but, but so far so far one that's yeah. co it's colossal I mean, I mean how else has that uh, changed is there any other evidence that we should be uh, aware of in terms of <clears throat> the environment's been changed by by the IRA and by the European Green Deal? Well, I prefer that kind of macro evidence. I've got plenty of anecdotal evidence, uh, stories of particular firms who are about to locate here or in Europe who, who have moved over to the US to take advantage of the various tax credits and incentives in, in the US space. Um, but uh, as economists, anecdata don't make, a, uh, no. as we call them, a compelling story. But there's, there's plenty of stories. And, and Hannah, you, you, it's incredible that you've got this amount of money ready to in, invest. And, and of course, those of us who've got an eye on um, trying to address some of the disadvantaged communities that we're talking about. I mean, we've just been to a, 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 a session this morning, the Diabetes UK. Um, the, the rate of, of adolescent uh, diabetes is on the rise, and the result is... 13 years reduction in, in, in life expectancy. These are the sort of things we, we see. So I'm just thinking in terms of your pot, you know, are you, have you got that ESG um, approach to how that's going to, does, does that enter into your thinking at all in terms of how you deploy your resources? I have to be clear, it's not my pot. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, oh, oh, you wish. <laughs> um, but, 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 but across the industry, I mean, the, as a whole, the industry is firmly behind the transition to net zero, and they see that in the broadest yeah. sense. We want to do good. If I think about the purpose of the ABI that we introduced when I, when I joined um, last year, it is together driving change to protect and build a thriving society. My members are behind that. That's what we want to do. Um, I'd be very happy to have a conversation with you to learn more about, about uh, the meeting that you had earlier today. Mm. I think you raise a really interesting point, though. From my perspective, one of the drivers behind mobilising the forum was there had been uh, political and regulatory reform, and as an industry, we wanted to deliver our part against that. But we have faced a challenge which Lord Harrington has identified in his review, which is there is no one-stop shop for us to be able to go to. So we have been engaging with many departments across Whitehall. We've been engaging at the regional level to try and identify where are the where are the projects? Where is the pipeline of investable projects that we want to be able to invest in? And it does seem to me that there is a need for a long-term strategic plan to ensure that as a, as a whole, the UK can benefit from the investment potential that's there. I just want, want uh, your, your question triggered a, f a couple of further thoughts, if I, if I may. Um, firstly, uh, there's an excellent LSE paper um, led by Dimitri Zangelis that you should be aware on, on productivity issues. Um, secondly, in terms of uh, diabetes, because as, as, uh, the, the health and productivity nexus is very close. Uh, last night, yesterday, I was in Cyprus um, telling them or talking with them about how they can change their... Uh, economy, air pollution and particulate matter is the fourth biggest killer uh, of people in Cyprus because they're running their economy on oil. They're still burning oil. Now, it's not as bad here in the UK. We've made big strides on Im improving health outcomes related to respiratory disease and, and pollution, but it's still a big issue in terms of both death and productivity loss. And I think one thing to really not lose sight of is that even if these things are sometimes more difficult to quantify economically, we know there's a raft of these other benefits that will flow from the net zero yes. transition. Yeah. You know, we, we haven't, we've got a team looking at productivity gains. They look significant but modest at the economy-wide level. But these kind of health-related effects, yeah. they're not necessarily in there, because not yet at least, because they're, they're hard to quantify. But I think they're quite important. 
whilst I've got you, just just on the the structure of these, uh, the IRA and the uh, green EU green industrial uh, plan, we can't do things on that scale. It's just not possible. But are there any lessons that the UK could lift from these programmes, um, from the design, the implementation? Is there anything to 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 pinch? Yeah, um, so just on the scale, yes, we can't do, uh, you know, the estimated number was 370 billion, but it's you know, effectively uncapped. But, you know, there's what, about that many Americans, roughly speaking, so um, oh, at the million level, so it's 1,000 per person. Uh, and you can then do the numbers here. That would be a 60 billion, um, well, adjusting for currencies, say 50 billion pound program here if you scaled it down. Yes. So it gives you a sense of, and, and this is not wildly off, you know, the Committee on Climate Change's number is about 40 billion per annum. Uh, we scale up to that by 2030. The LSE Grantham's uh, uh, paper suggests about 1% of GDP, so 20, 25, 26 billion, levering in another 2%. So, so the scale, you can adjust that down and work out what we roughly need to do, as I say, Oxford will have a paper coming out in the next week or so that, that is in the same order of magnitude. It's low tens of billions. And then the second part of your question is, so what do we learn about the design mechanism as well as the, the scale? And I think you know, it's very hard to get these kind of large-scale incentives completely perfect. You're not going to. There'll be waste. There'll be some degree of dodginess around the edges and some things that you incentivize that probably would have happened anyway. So, you know, the, I'm, I'm not sitting here and saying the IRA is a perfect instrument, but it has been designed in a way that um, for the most, I mean, there's lots of different components of it, but many of them effectively match the private with the public. So you're in partnerships, so the risks look lower, so the government effectively has a has a stake in what's going on because you've got a tax credit or a, some sort yeah. of production credit. And I think, you know, the Americans aren't, aren't stupid when it comes to doing this sort of thing. I think, well, well, we, we, I think we, we were mightily impressed at, the, at the, uh, the attention they'd given to working out how these programs would impact. You know, you talked about bonus credits that meet certain con uh, conditions, uh, such as locating in low-income communities or meeting domestic content requirement. That seemed to be well worked through um, and I'm just wondering if, if you think there's scope and is it appropriate for us to adopt the same sort of granular approach because this, this was quite focused on how it was going to impact is the scope and should we do it uh, yes and yes uh, yeah. now of course it'll look different for the UK context and um, well, we've know. had a number of programs that have just run into the sand you know we ha haven't had the, you know, I'm thinking about insulating homes and things of that nature. Mm. It hasn't happened to any great effect. And I think everybody would accept that it hasn't happened. No, that's so right. If we could just pick up their algorithms and... Other and it's other crazy that that hasn't happened. I mean, you talk, talk about wasting vast amounts of money every year. Uh, that's a, a perfectly good example. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ian Labour. Thanks, uh, Chair. We, we've discussed very briefly, we've touched on the... Uh, the US Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, uh, and of course the EU's Green Deal Industrial Plan. We'll touch on that this morning. But could you see what effect that these plans have on the UK's competitiveness in net zero industries? Yeah, uh, so the relative competitiveness, obviously, of the UK uh, looks poorer once you have this sort of heavy, large-scale intervention across other jurisdictions, whether it's um, the Americans, who uh, this is a big intervention, but it's a relatively late intervention if you compare it with the Chinese, who've been quietly and significantly putting money into these sectors for over a decade. And now, uh, here's not the place to work out whether these subsidies constitute um, anti-WTO sort of provisions that require response in a trade war. But what is clear is that a vast amount of saving and investment in China has gone into this space. Equally, the EU, the EU's response to the IRA is not the first thing the Europeans have done in this area. So we, we now have... Uh, very significant government action around the world in these areas. 
You can lament that if you're a kind of free marketeer economist. You can worry about the waste. You can worry about government misdirecting public funds, but it's happening. What does that mean for the UK? Well, I think we don't need to be, we're you know, small to medium sized open economy. We don't have to be competitive in every single sector. We, we won't be, we shouldn't try to be. We have to choose strategically the areas where we think we've got uh, a current base to build upon and that are strategically likely to yield good jobs and good profits effectively for the firms operating those spaces in the years to come. There's a tool online called the Green Transition Navigator that you can look at country by country looking at the current area of competitive advantage and where the adjacent spaces uh, may be. And I think you know, we in the UK uh, need to be clear-eyed about the fact that we're not going to win in all of these areas. In some cases, I'd say the, the boat has sailed. Um, I mean, various boats have been sailing in the last five years. We had the, uh, a remarkable moment with COVID with interest rates at rock bottom where we could have borrowed for a long time at almost nothing and done a massive investment in a green recovery. It wasn't entirely brown, but it was. It fell far short, Chair, to your point about the paper that we did mm. in the Oxford Review of what was possible, and I think that is a disappointment. But that doesn't mean that there won't be another boat that sails. Uh, you know, rates won't <coughs> probably stay this high in real terms forever. Uh, they will come down, and there will be a moment to do this sort of investment at the scale that others are doing relatively. You mentioned the fact that we we shouldn't look to be globally competitive in every single net zero sector. Right. You want to mention um, perhaps what net zero sectors we should be looking at and, and what the government could possibly do to enhance the UK's competitiveness in the zero, net zero industries. Yeah, uh, well, there's, you, could, you could write various papers in response. Uh, the Green Transition Navigator will help you look into the detail. But, but at a very high level, we've clearly got comparative, comparative advantage in wind technology and offshore wind. Uh, floating, Hannah mentioned, I think that is uh, an area of massive potential future growth. We have a competitive advantage in uh, bioenergy and carbon capture in the form of DRAX. You can argue about whether that's a good idea. You can argue about whether it can and should be scaled up. Uh, but it's a space where we, we are currently leading and have knowledge and technology there. So CCS, um, there's some capabilities in this country in, in hydrogen. Uh, and there's lots of these. Remember, this, we are a services powerhouse of an economy. And the services sector around this transition is incredibly strong, whether it's the green finance, the you know, chief executive consulting and advisory space. And that doesn't bring you a big manufacturing base in the north uh, of the country, uh, but it is an area of our comp comparative advantage that I think we can continue to, to grow as the transition plays out. The UK was at risk of the UK falling behind other climate progressive developed economies without comprehensive action to address the UK's low carbon competitiveness. This was a statement made in June 2023 by the Climate Change Committee. Do you, do you agree with the, the word of the statement? Um, yeah, in broad thrust, absolutely, I do. And I think, as I say, we, uh, there are some areas where falling behind may not matter so much, and there are other areas where it really uh, does matter. It's not my job to tell you which ones are which, but, but I think we do, uh, the CCC is right. Uh, we've, we've had a year that hasn't been a particularly brilliant one for this agenda, and if you look at the progress reports for performance on the coming couple of carbon budgets, they look more at risk now than they did 12 months ago. Well, I would agree that we need to accelerate progress if we are to deliver our ambition to achieve net zero. Um, I would highlight, though, some of the strengths that we can build on. Um, Professor Hepburn, you referred to our world-leading financial and professional services. Uh, we also have a reputation for rule of law. We then have our geography, expertise in a number of sectors. So those give us a very good foundation on which to build. I think what we would like to see is the government making progress on that national transition plan 
also taking the opportunity to build on other areas where we've been a world leader. The, um, the TFT disclosure framework is genuinely world leading. That's an opportunity for the UK to show competitiveness in a slightly different domain. We also need to make um, progress on a green taxonomy. Um, again, that's an opportunity for us to help give more confidence to investors and also to customers so that they know that the investments that they're making are indeed in, in green and sustainable uh, industries and technologies. Okay, Mark Wolsey, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I'm interested in where, what the UK strengths and weaknesses are, and uh, Professor Hepburn, you just gave us a list of uh, areas where the UK has competitive advantage, being offshore wind, bioenergy, CCS and hydrogen, but I wonder if I could ask Hannah first, if I may. Um, you mentioned that you're, you've got UK investors who are very, very willing to in, invest in, in the UK. Are you going after Professor Cameron's list, or rather, do you have a different, uh, a different target zone? The areas that we chose to focus on were essentially to avoid boiling the ocean um, because we could have put the 100 billion towards any areas of the economy and we thought those would be ones where we might be able to make reasonable progress in a short time frame. The forum itself is intended to be only for 12 months with a final report coming out in early July. Um, we have done a lot of work engaging with many stakeholders to identify that project pipeline I've referred to. Um, I think, what, again, one of the opportunities that we see for, for the UK government is to learn some lessons from the Inflation Reduction Act in the States and the EU Green Deal, which is really exploring blended finance opportunities. Blended finance is a way in which you can crowd in more investment, and that's very important for insurers because our risk profile is quite different from that of, say, a bank. Um, because we're investing over multiple decades, we need that steady, predictable rate of return. If we can find ways working with the government, there are opportunities to bring in new types of institutional investment at earlier stages of different projects across multiple sectors. But I can't say that we have so that spent... that would be as a part investor in, in, a, in a, joint, well, a joint approach, is that what you're saying? It depends at what point in the investment cycle. I think we've seen um, an interesting... Uh, pilot opportunity emerge around EV charge points. At the moment, those are being deployed across different areas of the country. The government's got an ambition to get 300,000 charge points by, by 2030. But at the moment, these are largely funded by subsidies. We are currently working with the Green Finance Institute to see can we develop a model that would enable uh, the subsidy or grant to be moved to either a government or a UK infrastructure back backed loan mm. that would then enable insurers to contribute also to that upfront investment. And the hope would be over time, as that market matures, that the government support could fall away entirely. So that's one area where we're looking to see can we come up with new innovative ways of blended finance arrangements. Yeah, and uh, do you agree with Professor uh, Hepburn uh, about these areas of com comparative advantage? Presumably you'd invest in those rather than the areas that Professor Cameron describes as where the boat has sailed. As an industry, we always have to look for what will give us the best balance of risk and return given we are investing for people's futures. We have to have regards to the return. But equally, we want to support a just transition, and this is where that national transition plan from the government is so critical. Yeah. And would you see uh, investment opportunities in other countries, or are your funds exclusively targeted at UK investments? The reason we focused our forum efforts on the UK is that it seemed, from my perspective, a very odd policy outcome if the government changed the UK prudential regulatory framework for insurers that simply enabled money to flow out of the country. We wanted to see what investment we could look to generate within the but UK. You want to get the best return for your investors and the best return may not be in the UK. What, what would happen in those circumstances? It would be as happens today that we would have a diversified portfolio. So what would encourage you to put a greater proportion of your portfolio right now uh, in the UK? What needs to happen? We need greater certainty that decisions made today will hold, not just tomorrow, but in 5, 10, 20 years' time. Okay, well, give me an example of a decision that's been made that hasn't, isn't holding for five years. I think we've seen delays to decisions about size well C, for example, that may have um, led to um, some uncertainty around whether that is an appropriate investment opportunity for the industry. Obviously, it's a matter for individual businesses, but 
the fact that nuclear industry can now have this regulated asset-based model, which has proved effective for other, other infrastructure projects, such as the Thames Tideway Tunnel, would seem that it would, in theory, be a good match for insurers. But, as I say, there have been delays around some of the decisions in that, in that area. And the decisions taken on home heating and the EV mandate, would you consider those as being reasons why... Uh, you know, you might not, you might choose not to invest in those areas. <clears throat> I think we see those as areas where we want to work collaboratively to see can we create solutions so that we can get that risk return profile a better fit for insurers and long term savings and providers. Professor Hepburn, you, you did speak about the boat having sailed. Tell us where, mm. uh, the, the, what are the examples? Where is the boat sailed? Is, is automotive one of those? Well, as, as I said earlier, I mean, I think it's, it's not yet. Uh, it's in peril. You're seeing vast arrays of very cheap EVs uh, coming out of China that we, we are not going to compete with, with that particular market segment very easily. Uh, but there, of course, is huge opportunity for the UK car industry, the brands that are much loved by consumers here and all around the world, so I wouldn't write them off yet. Um, I'd like to uh, just note that uh, I'm not sure that the, the definitive Hepburn list of sectors where we have a comparative advantage was the, the, was the one that I set out earlier. There, there'll be some uh, more in that list. It was, uh, you know, I'd like to do my best to answer questions that they're asked of me. I mean, I, I would certainly add to that list. Uh, we have phenomenal world-beating capability in science and research and development not just in this area, obviously, across the board, but in this area as well. And if we could do a better job of using that expertise to, to both create the ventures and then scale the ventures in a way that keeps the IP and the equity in the UK, we'd be in, in better shape too. Yeah, but where else does the, has, have we missed opportunities? Where have we not been ready fast enough to mm -hmm. take advantage uh, of, of the green transition? Well, uh, I think um, for various reasons, we, we don't exactly have a thriving onshore wind business. Uh, there's every reason to have thought that, you know, if you go back 20 years, could the UK have built out a, a world leading wind turbine business so that they're not located in Denmark, uh, Germany and China? You know, they're, they're the countries you think of, Vestas and um, the others. Why aren't we on that list? We've got great expertise in turbines um, for jet engines and the rest of it, Rolls-Royce and others. Um, so I'm pretty confident in saying the boat sailed there and we weren't on it. Um, but look, I mean, I'm giving you examples off the top of my head here rather than doing a... a yeah. prefer to have a proper study. Right, and yeah. on hydrogen, big opportunities there. We seem to be making progress on transport in hydrogen but the government's not going to make a decision on domestic heating until 2016. So is that in the uh, missed out list or is that in the uh, um, uh, you know, areas of, of comparative advantage and opportunity? Well, um, in my mind, at least, you just opened quite a big can of worms because um, whether, whether we should be using hydrogen in domestic home heating, I think, is, is, a, is a question uh, uh, to which I think the answer is probably no uh, uh, for various reasons, some to do with the second law of thermodynamics and others to do with costs and supply chain. So, you know, some boats sail and you may not want to be on them. And, and perhaps that's one of them. Uh, in terms of hydrogen for transport, certainly for personal mobility, again, uh, I'm not sure that's a boat the Japanese are particularly enjoying being on right now. Um, now, perhaps for more um, industrial, you know, sh shipping hydrogen and its uh, related molecules, ammonia and methanol, that's somewhere where we can be thinking hard at this point. And you mentioned that if we were to match the IRA, that would amount to £40 billion pounds per annum investment by the UK. We're not going to get there, but there's plenty of research that suggests we should be putting in about 1% of GDP, which you uh, gave us the figure of £25 billion. Um, If we do that, where's it coming from? Yeah, I mean, those, those figures are, are, are roughly right. Um, and uh, where's it coming from? Well, so at the moment, if you look at our, the structure of our savings and investment, um, not only, as I said earlier, not only do we invest less than comparable countries, a lot less. Uh, We're not going to suddenly change our savings ratio, are we? Well, um, 
Dare I say the following in a political context? I do think we need fewer decaf oat lattes and a bit more on our insulation of our buildings, so less consumption and more investment. It's not a, it's not a politically wonderful line. I mentioned it to a peer the other day. We're a market economy and people do what they want to do, don't they? Well, of course. They, and they, they, and they, is our buy lattes? And they should buy their lattes, and I do as well. But, uh, but I think what we can do at the government level is to structure the set of incentives at the economy. So how, do we enc- so, how do we encourage that change? Right, so th- that's the right question, so that we're not such miserable savers, <laughs> as I say, right at the bottom of the list. Okay. The list. And perhaps that hand, but I'm asking people, think the customers there, the consumer is aware of the nature of transition, bearing in mind that in many cases they are people who are investing in pension funds. Are they aware of the magnitude of investment and why it's important? Um, that, probably not. Uh, that's a great question actually. So from a customer point of view, we do see through um, research that the individual firms undertake that there's uh, an increasing interest in making sure that your savings and investments are directed towards sustainable ends. But at the same time, we also see uh, in a study by Scottish Widows last year that around about 30% of people didn't know what a sustainable pension was. So there's a huge education need um, that I think we all need to get behind. Um, Going back to the professor's point, though, just about savings, if I think about it from a a pension adequacy point of view... um, one of, the, one of the key areas of focus for the ABI over a period of many years has been looking at the future of auto-enrolment because mm-hmm. while it has been a success in many ways with you know, millions of people saving into pensions that they otherwise wouldn't have, the contribution rates are not sufficient to enable people to have the retirements that mm-hmm. they deserve. It doesn't matter how good a rate of return that we're able to generate. It would need to be a Herculean rate of return in order to match the difference between a defined contribution pension versus defined benefit pension. So I think there is also a need to work collectively, public and private sector, to help educate people on why saving matters. And in fact, that's a campaign that we've started in partnership with um, the Pension and Lifetime Savings Association called Pension Attention. We launched that two years ago. We're in the throes of um, preparing uh, our third third year with a a soon-to-be-announced ambassador but the aim is to really catch people's attention across different demographics and get and get us all focused on saving more would you favor an addition to a, a pension enrollment focused purely and exclusively on the green transition is that something that c- your customers your consumers would be happy to to adhere to i think what customers want is choice so we need to help educate them on what are the investment choices available to them so that they can then select them in a way that's simple and easy um, easy to implement. And the point I'm trying to get from you is that are they ready to earmark that for this green transition that we're talking about or, or are they simply interested in the best possible return to provide them with the best possible retirement? We do see some customers actually uh, who prioritise um, the transition over the rate of return and there are various online tools and applications that enable customers to decide which, which type of fund they want to invest in. Thank you Chair. Um, thank you. I'm going to bring in Jane in a sec, but can I just check? Um, if we're trying to mobilise um, the money that we need, I mean, $100 billion that is devoted to this, Hannah, is about $10 billion a year. It was $100 billion over 10 years, is that right? Yeah. Yes. So UK business investment last year is about $270 billion. So the kind of fund, if it's running out at $10 billion a year, that's only about 4% of total UK business investment. That seems quite a small number compared to the grand total of the investment that we need. How do you think about that investment gap? So the, the investment gap is, is a really important issue, and I'm glad you've asked the question. Just in terms of the $100 billion, this relates specifically to mm. investments that are going to be enabled by Reforms to Solvency UK. Mm. Analysis that the ABI undertook um, back in 2021 suggested that the industry would be able to contribute... Uh, up to a third of the investment needed to get to 2035 carbon reduction targets, which equates to about 60 billion a year. Uh-huh. So the 100 billion is almost like a, diff- a slightly different pot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, and in fact, there was research um, produced yesterday that suggests if we're able to tackle some of the barriers to investment, uh, the pensions industry might be able to contribute as much as a half towards the investment that's okay. needed. So we're still missing a half, a half to two thirds of the investment that we need. Which is why I think those blended finance models and looking at new types of yeah. approach with government is so important. So the IMF has published quite recently um, a framework for helping governments think about uh, the way that they put 
public money in. So there's good old-fashioned grant, um, and then on the sell side, there are a, a range of instruments like tax credits, full expensing, good old-fashioned corporate corporation tax cuts, um, and then on the buy side, there are consumer grants, there's consumer tax incentives as well. To what degree do you think your members are able to come to a consensus about the optimum mix of how public money goes in through those instruments? I'm not sure that my members would achieve consensus on that. I think what they would like to see from government is a roadmap on what investment is needed when so that they can plan what investment they'll be able to provide year on year for different types of projects that meet their particular needs in terms of risk and return. If government is putting aside, say, let's say for the sake of argument, £28 billion in public investment into helping support the transition to a green economy, how do you, what, what would your members say to government about the way that money should come into the economy? They would want to have a conversation uh, and recognising that it's not just our industry that's part of, part yeah. of the equation here. You, you have other types of financial institution, you have philanthropic uh, bodies as well. Yeah. All of our interests and our intended outcomes will be slightly different. Okay, but, to, but what you're not saying is just put all of the money on corporation tax cuts. I think you need to look at these issues in the round. I know that there have been some uh, previous witnesses who've talked about the need to look at the tax environment. Certainly, mm -hmm. I do know that from an industry perspective, we like to have certainty for as long as possible around the tax environment. Yeah. Um, there, there may be different types of incentive that need to be thought of quite laterally, actually, in terms of the, the question that was asked earlier about job creation and how do you incentivise this in different regions. There may be a need to think about tax incentives to bring particular skills and professions into certain regions so that can become a thriving hub. OK, so the, the, there's no kind of obvious answer. Well, I, I, th I think there is an answer. Oh. Um, the, the way I think about this is that our, our fiscal space is limited. Mm -hmm. If you're going to spend $28 billion or any other number between 10 and 30 a year, then you have to do it in a way that... Um, you, you spend it wisely in a way that the private sector will have difficulty to do itself. So part of this is around identifying where the uh, economies of, of scale or the increasing returns are in the economy and grabbing them, aligning it with your strategy about where you want to be uh, to have a comparative advantage in the future. Uh, another space is in infrastructure, where actually, you know, yes, the private sector does like to invest in infrastructure, but only if the risks are really low. The, one of the things our report coming out in the next week will say is that the, the, the public sector investment requirement can be reduced rather significantly if the government gets the right policy mix. Because ultimately this is about capital yeah. flowing where it needs to flow. If you design, so if you, know, if you stop subsidising things that you don't want to have happen, which we still do quite a lot of, uh, and you don't have to simply subsidise things you do happen to increase the returns, you can design policy that reduces the risk, you can design these sort of blended finance mechanisms. So infrastructure and areas where there is a, a fairly urgent need to capture or retain advantage in an area that we think is strategically important. So following on from that point mm. then, we seem to be focusing on big banks putting big money into things, that big ticket uh, things like wind, CCS, um, hydrogen, etc. But what about the small engineering business in the middle of Loughborough that makes widgets? How do they get investment in order to get to net zero? You want to? Well, I, I will say that one of, again, my observations since we mobilised the Investment Delivery Forum is that the scale of investment that we're talking about on behalf of the industry I represent, which are not banks, they are insurers and pension, mm -hmm. pension providers, um, the scale of investment is very large and we need large projects in which we can invest. So I think your question is, is probably not one for, for me or my industry to answer because there are, there are challenges just to do with the amount of money that we need to invest targeting individual companies of the kind that you've described. But Professor Hepburn, if, if, the, if the money is being taken into large projects by Hannah's um, organisation for whatever reason, what is then happening to those small businesses where, after all, most people are actually employed in this country? Yeah, look, I think it's a very important question. And um, the, whether those businesses can access the capital that they need to grow and expand, it, it will depend, again, upon whether their investors think they're appropriate risk-adjusted returns for those sorts of firms. And that will depend upon the, the, uh, the enabling and the surrounding policy environment and whether they are playing in an industrial ecosystem that looks like it's set to grow or looks like it's set to go out of business. So 
you know, uh, the if you, uh, as I'm sure you probably saw in in America on your trip, uh, when you have such a, a a large and targeted program of the sort that we see over there with the IRA, uh, you're effectively intervening within industrial ecosystems. So y yes, you're focused on these various big prizes, uh, yeah. but uh, as you as you lift the ecosystem so that it becomes more competitive, your SMEs who are playing in that ecosystem will also benefit and one would hope be able to find more uh, better access to capital. I mean, there's another discussion to be had about the banking system, uh, business banking system in the UK, but perhaps that's not for, for now, uh, and how well it does financing SMEs compared to, say, in, in Germany or, or other countries. Okay, so it tends to go back to the chairman's first question about jobs. Um, and you were saying there was going to be a lot of jobs. There might be a lot of jobs in the new industries, but that actually might be forgoing those in the older industries. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, so there are some winners and losers. The, the jobs figures I gave are net figures, um, I think, f for the most part. And uh, inevitably, in the industries that are sunset industries, there'll, there'll be sunset jobs there. And I think as with the, the capital turnover story, where what, what you, you don't want to scrap assets before they've reached the end of their life. But when they do reach the end of their life, you want to make sure that fossil assets are replaced with clean assets so you're not wasting money. Similar sorts of things can be said about people's real lives and their working careers. Uh, you know, you, you ideally want to train up a generation so that they're ready for the jobs of the future and, and phase down the jobs that actually we're simply not going to need in 50 years' time so you're not suddenly having to fire large numbers of people because a company's gone out of business because it hasn't seen the transition coming, even though it's been on its way for you know decades. Not necessarily the case, of course, that we won't need widgets anymore. It's no. just that they won't get the funding to get to net zero. But there we are. Thank you. Um, Ian Lavery, do you want to come in very briefly on the... Just, just very briefly. Uh, obviously, there's huge challenges and trade-offs uh, ahead. Uh, for the government, what what are the uh, to, to ensure that we have a just transition to to net zero? What do you think the main challenges and perhaps trade-offs might be? I think uh, a lot a lot of them do relate to the labour market and the skills um, challenges. So you know we're, we're a long way behind on skills now, whether it's heating engineers who can do heat pumps rather than gas boilers or or other domains. So skilling up ahead of time before we have a labour market crunch and we find that the transition is delayed because we don't have the jobs and actually people aren't ready to get jobs that are there and are waiting for them, that's important. But then as I said right at the start, we'll have a, a challenge towards the back end of the mid-century when a lot of the capital has been built out and those jobs are no longer needed. You do have a higher level of steady state jobs but we will be skilling people up and then um, you know, after 10 or 20 years not needing them anymore. Now that is half a career, but I think we have to be, in terms of the justice of the transition, really acutely aware of its impacts on, on labour around the country and, and aware, as you've been rightly uh, focused some of your questions on, on, on the impacts across space and different geographical areas of, of the country as well. And just finally, uh, in last September, the Prime Minister announced extensions uh, to the deadlines for phasing out the sale of new gas boilers, which you just mentioned, and the, the new petrol and diesel cars and vans stating, and, and this is what the, the Prime Minister actually said, if we continue down this path, we'll risk losing the consent of the British people. Was the Prime Minister right in, in uh, was the decision right? Is what he said right? Well, he's right that um, consent is incredibly important here. Bringing people along with us is incredibly important. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that this was a decision that suddenly increased uh, people's consent for the net zero transition. Uh, in terms of its impact on, direct impact on emissions and our ability to hit our goals, uh, it's negative but not huge, those two delays. I think my uh, stronger concern is the message it sends to Hannah's point about policy certainty, credibility, longevity, strategic focus, et cetera, and direction. Uh, and indeed, you know, those sorts of changes that are negative changes to the path that we know we have to go on actually risk losing us jobs and reducing consent, I would say, rather than supporting 
um, you know, the clarity, the investment, the job creation that we need. But, but certainly the Prime Minister is right that public uh, uh, buy-in, public consent, uh, is incredibly important. And um, there's lots that we can do in many different parts of this transition to increase that. To give you one example, you have resistance to uh, new power facilities in different parts of the country. Why? Well, because there's no obvious benefit. What we see in other countries is when communities benefit from cheaper electricity, they're desperate to mm. have the wind farm or the, you know, the local bit of kit in their, in their locality because it will, it will reduce costs for them and, and yield benefits. So I think it's not rocket science, but get, getting buy into these changes just requires sharing the benefits with those who are participating. Yeah. Hello. Well, I, I, I'll just make a sort of macro point, um, which is that my observation is that as an industry, we have a very long-term time horizon. We're talking 50, 60 plus years. And that puts us at odds quite often with the political cycle. And I think one of the challenges that we have is short-termism. And we need to find a way of introducing a long-term perspective. I don't pretend to have the answer to this. I recognise it is politically very challenging. But that's what's essential, that when a decision is made, that we've got confidence that that decision is going to last over the long term. Um, one suggestion that we've made in our uh, policy programme document is around empowering some of the um, executive agencies and bodies such as the um, OBR, um, potentially giving them a greater level of independence and also an obligation to look at the multiplier effect of the benefit of good long-term investment. And potentially, that would also... Um, be supported by a new fiscal policy committee that would look not just at the risks of investment, but also at the risks of not investing, because I think we don't think about that often enough. If I put it in a personal context, we're always so worried about what if I put £100 into my current account, I won't lose any money. But equally, by not putting it into um, a, a shares ISA, for example, I'm potentially losing out. We, we often focus on the near and the near and how the near and now, rather than actually what are the long-term potential benefits of investing for job creation, public assets. So that would be my hope that we can find a way to introduce a long-termism approach to this agenda because it's just too important for us as a country not to do it. Okay, clock is slightly against us. That's been an incredibly helpful session. You've basically said that um, the transition to net zero is going to create jobs overall. Um, many of those will be good jobs. We're not 100% clear where they will be, and so we're not clear whether they will be in places where there are skills gaps, but there are going to be some sectors that are obvious winners, like energy, buildings, transport, wind, biomass, CCS, uh, potentially hydrogen. There are some sectors that potentially are in a bit of peril. Um, there is going to be an investment gap, and therefore there is going to need to be public money that goes in, but to maximise the private sector contribution, we're going to need a long-term strategy or a net transition plan, as you called it, Hannah. Um, there may be some problems around particular sectors like buildings and retrofitting. We probably need to see a bit more um, on that. But faster decisions and consistent decisions will help. We're going to need blended finance models that are probably context-specific. And a big theme from what you've said has been the emphasis that you've put on a major plan for um, helping the labour market adapt and make the most of the opportunities to come. So that has been a brilliant session. Thank you so much indeed for evidence. Do please send us things that you think we would benefit from as we draw up our recommendations. But for now, that's that. Order, order. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. indeed. That's excellent. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
the proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. Order, order. Welcome to the second panel of today's Business and Trade Select Committee inquiry into the industrial, industrial strategy that we need for the transition to net zero. Thank you so much indeed um, to our witnesses for joining us uh, from across British industry. Um, I'm going to kick off and we're going to try and move through the questions um, quite quickly. Um, but Carl, perhaps I could just start with you and it will be the same question to each of you if you wouldn't mind just answering um, as briefly and as concisely as you can. Could you tell us is the transition to net zero, in your view, going to create jobs? And do we need an industrial strategy from government to help navigate this great shift that we've got to make, Carl? Um, I think, yes, definitely it will create jobs because we need to upskill and retrain uh, a lot of the sector. Um, not so much in the manufacturing side. So from a manufacturing perspective, we've got that capability and that competence uh, in-house. Um, th my comments are more directed towards the uh, installer section of the industry. Yep. Um, we have something like 130,000 gas registered installers. <coughs> installers in the UK employed by 55,000 companies. And that tells you they're very small micro businesses in the main. Uh, and therefore getting to them to upskill them is, uh, is a challenge. Uh, but. Uh, our company and uh, many of the boiler manufacturers and heat pump manufacturers training installers all the time. So we're training two, three thousand installers on uh, heat pumps currently a year at the moment, uh, and that number rises to fifteen thousand when yeah. we talk about. So from your view, good for jobs. Good for jobs, definitely. Yeah, Duncan. Yeah, good for jobs. I mean, offshore wind, as an example, has already grown to thirty thousand. This is an industry which didn't exist that long ago, and we can see it growing to more than a hundred thousand by the end of the decade. And I think, when you look around the world at what's happening to offshore wind, there is actually an even bigger opportunity to go beyond that. If we can attract and be successful in competing for more of the manufacturing, then there's that, those numbers can be higher. Does an industrial strategy help you navigate the future? I think if we want to have a competitive offer for what are global supply chains to make their investments here, then I think a holistic approach <coughs> which looks at skills, um, yeah, skills at reasonable cost, looks at the business environment, looks at the, at the infrastructure, I think... One of the things for offshore wind is one example is that it needs ports. So ports investments, infrastructure investments are the sorts of things which make those a decisionable opportunity for a, for a global manufacturer. Yeah. James? I think broadly yes, but with a caveat. I think that caveat's around UK supply chain and what those jobs and where those jobs are. Uh, as an EPC installer, so we operate across hydrogen, solar, a variety of other clean energy sectors, a lot of our supply chain at the moment is based outside the UK. We may talk about it later, but competition from IRA in America, European investment, means that some of those supply chains and skills are establishing themselves outside of the UK. Therefore, I think there's a need for industrial strategy that focuses on development of UK supply chain and UK jobs. Interesting. We've just heard from Professor Hepburn that retrofitting buildings will be probably the biggest single sector of job creation. Um, and you're saying that actually we may need some help just onshoring some of that supply chain? I think in part, yes. So, there's, so I think retrofit, um, there are a larger number of, of, of UK jobs that will come from that and UK skills. But if I look at perhaps, I think it was Professor Hepburn that was talking about some of those sunset industries. Mm. We, if we don't reskill and invest in UK supply chain quickly, we may find some of those jobs are offshored outside of the UK. So I'm thinking particularly, we talked about hydrogen and CCUS. So for example, hydrogen supply chain, is it starting to establish itself in the electrolyzer market outside of the UK? There are UK startups but they aren't typically well-placed to, to take on industrial-scale schemes. OK. James? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Alistair? Uh, I agree with everything that's kind of been said already by the panel, but um, ultimately, to answer your question directly, yes. Um, I think the, kind of the point at the end of the last session when we talked about the transition um, from work is going to be particularly important in terms of where the kind of winners and losers um, end in that kind of space. 
and we need to make sure that's kind of appropriately kind of uh, there's a plan in place for that and there's appropriately uh, kind of any mitigations that are kind of put in place but I think kind of to Duncan's point around ensuring that kind of all levers of um, government pol policy are pointing in the right direction is going to be critically important to making the, the kind of the most out of the opportunity that's coming for the UK. So good for jobs, but we need an industrial strategy to help steer the path. Yeah, okay, thank you. Andy McDonald. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think, James, you've already touched upon this to a very large degree. Uh, it's about the way the global competitive uh, nature of one of these technologies has changed um, following the IRA and the, and, and, the, and the European Green Deal. Has anybody else got any thoughts about how, what evidence they've seen of that uh, shift? Because we're trying to get a handle on this, how effective mm. it's been. Duncan, do you want to... Do you want to Yes, the, the, I mean, as the momentum has been building to decarbonise electricity around the world, we've seen a massive growth in the competition for capital, for skills, for supply chain. Um, that has led to some constraints. I think when we look at the IRA in the US and the Green Deal in, the, in Europe, that's, that's added and amplified to that. We've seen that it, um, you know, it, it can really work. Um, it intensifies that competition. Uh, we've also seen that you can get it wrong. And if you, yeah. if you put a, a really strong and attractive um, you know, mechanism like that, it can be a massive draw for investment and attention, but you can also get it wrong if you, if you don't have a realistic, it can be stretching, but a realistic pathway to actually make physical things happen. If you want to create new manufacturing, new supply chains, then... Uh, you know, that needs to be visible, otherwise neither will happen, neither the investment nor the infrastructure that t relies on it. So there's some warning signs there, and you're, you're, sort of, you're touching upon my next question really, around design and implementation yep. of, of these plants. I mean, are we seeing things that you think will work, and definitely, and then on the contrary, um, are things we shouldn't be doing? But there are, the, are there any things that we could, we could pinch from that, from that structure? I don't know, Alistair. I don't know. Yeah, no, maybe to start. I think um, the kind of the reality is that kind of I think we've touched on before as well. Kind of the US and Europe, China will be coming coming at this from kind of slightly different contexts. And so, you know, clearly, um, as has been kind of mentioned a few times, we're not going to kind of uh, compete pound for pound with the US in terms of no. direct subsidy, and, and nor should we. Um, I think we need to kind of lean into the strengths that we have in, here in the UK. Um, I think we've had kind of stable investable policy mechanisms um, in place that have drawn in a lot of capital, mm. but it's how do we make sure that those policy and regulatory uh, frameworks that we have in place can be kind of reorientated to support um, kind of industrial strategy, because I think there's been a bit of a trade-off at the moment around kind of maybe an over-focus on near-term cost over uh, long-term value. Anybody want to add? I'll just add a comment, really, when you start looking at electrification of heat and, and heat pumps, um, the outdoor units particularly, I doubt whether we'll be manufacturing those locally in the UK or even locally in Europe. They're already um, being supplied and sourced from China, from the Far East, because effectively they're an air conditioning unit running in reverse. So the typical Chinese air conditioning manufacturers are dominating that market, where we're looking to <coughs> secure manufacturing context uh, for the UK market is then the rest of the system that we need to add to that outdoor unit, all the, all the equipment inside the property is where we'll focus our attention. I think I would, you know, in the last five years we've bought, bought major contracts with more, more than 230 UK companies for our offshore wind farms and a quarter of those we've then taken overseas where we're building offshore wind farms around the world. So it can be done and we do have a foundation. I, I, the, the, the policy framework we've got here in energy is respected. It gives us a strong, relatively mature supply base to start with. But what we're looking at is a trebling or even quintupling of the size of that supply chain in the, in the decade to come. That's an enormous opportunity. And what, the way we should be looking at it is to say, well, where have we got a strong enough foundation that we can be competitive and make a, an offer to supply chain companies where they where they make the choice well we've got something here there's an environment that's stable there's it's predictable it's inviting you know we, we can be successful here we can we can make a fair return for the investment that we're going to make and you know identify the areas where we 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 can be attractive like that and there are some we've seen good examples of 
everything from you know turbine blades through to high voltage cables and if you're a manufacturer it's often the case that the lowest risk best proposition for making your next <coughs> big investment in capacity is where you see a track record I'll just make two two quick points if that's okay I think um, so I think I, I generally agree I think with what Carl was saying I think if you look at UK manufacturing nine percent of GDP is associated with manufacturing output that jumps to close to 18 percent when you look at specialist technology-led manufacturing and so it's that rest of the systems and those specialist components that we think is where industrial strategy will drive jobs in UK supply chain I think that the part that then underpins that that I would then reference is, is skills we may come on to that later in the conversation but in order to make that industrial strategy land we need access to the right skills in the UK UK to support the growth of those innovative supply chains. Yeah, it was just with a question on the back of the chair's initial uh, question. Uh, I think, Duncan, you mentioned about the uh, access to port facilities and infrastructure around that. I just wonder, from Alistair's point of view and, and Duncan, um, does the in, the in the absence of an industrial strategy as we have it at the moment, does the uh, introduction of free ports or green ports in Scotland, does that make any difference in terms of um, not just the availability of infrastructure but some of the tax incentives that are around the, those areas as well? And, and, you know, is that enough or would you like government to have that underpinning industrial strategy as well to give you a, a real clear vision of what the future might be for your industry, especially in off offshore wind, for example. Yeah, maybe I'm just going to start off on that. I think um, it's it's one of many levers that kind of government and devolved uh, governments have at their disposal, and ultimately, kind of, as if we're talking about a coherent industrial strategy that's going to deliver the, the kind of the, kind of the, the best outcomes for UK PLC, we're going to need all of these kind of pulling in the right direction. You know, clearly, um, there's a kind of whole range of um, opportunities that Scotland has. Um, in kind of the energy transition, you know, we as a company are kind of planning to invest kind of forty billion pounds over the next uh, decade. Twenty billion of that is, is due to be in Scotland. So we kind of see a, a huge opportunity. But I suppose from the how do you deliver on that? It's you know, the kind of free ports are obviously one element where there are kind of direct incentives. But how are they, how is their direct uh, investment in the port infrastructure that's going to be needed to deploy? Um, kind of future uh, of offshore wind turbines, notably kind of floating offshore wind and Scott wind. How are the networks going to be built to uh, connect those assets um, into the system? You know, what are the flexibility of flexible technologies that are going to be needed to do that? Ultimately, with all of the deployment of these, it's going to need a whole range of levers all pulling in the same direction. And actually, I think we, if we kind of maybe look at, look back in terms of how the UK has performed, it has performed well in certain areas, but it's maybe not captured the the maximum opportunity from the investment it's taken to date because it hasn't had all of those levers pulling in the same direction. Mm. Duncan, do you yeah, I'd agree with that. Green ports and free ports are a really good, um, a, a good measure. And I think you know, we've seen quite a few. We've, we saw a sector deal for offshore wind a few years ago, and we've seen a number of rounds of grant funding. But this next phase is more intense. The competition is more intense. The stakes are bigger. The tickets are bigger so we, we need to do something different and something more here and I think that all, all levers aligned that more holistic approach you know with a mindset of what, what's the decision that a manufacturing investor is going to have to make to put it here what, what are they going to need to see yes it's skills, it's a workforce it's the infrastructure they need, it might be planning permissions, it's almost certainly for offshore wind at least a deep water quayside you know so uh, you know, we can help make that an easier decision. We can we can take risk away, and we can show the pathway for the f what's needed physically. Is there anything you specifically need from government to allow that to make your job easier, or to make that investment decisions easier? But what would it be? What would we be the start with the ports? Get the port investments going. Get that infrastructure invested so that the the, the deep water key sides are there, so that the access to power and a skilled workforce are there. That would, be, that would be a great platform to start with. OK, we're going to come back on this question over the course of the next questions. And Ian Lavery. <clears throat> uh, just briefly, how is international competition across the uh, supply chains affecting the delivery of the projects here in the UK? 
Anybody? Happy to, to, to start. I think um, from, from an electron perspective, we, we look at supply chains that cover solar, EV charging, hydrogen electrolyzers. And in all three of those areas in the last 18 months, two years, we've seen some significant challenges in availability. Um, that is starting to improve, but all of our supply chains for those key bits of kit are coming from outside of the UK. And we are seeing demand, particularly for our hydrogen electrolyzers. Um, we are having to, to, to try and place orders well in advance of achieving final investments decisions, which is having an impact on the ability to deliver projects as planned. So th the answer is yes, there is an impact on project delivery. Anybody else? Um, maybe to come in on that point, I think ultimately, um, you know, clearly supply chain uh, in certain components is tight, and that's driven by ambition here in the UK, but elsewhere. But I think actually one person's supply chain tightness is another person's supply chain opportunity um, to deliver on the, the ambition that's needed else, you know, in the UK and elsewhere there's going to need to be new supply chain capacity and I think the kind of particular plea that we would make um, uh, from policy makers is actually how can we help um, enable developers of UK infrastructure to be able to have early and at scale investment uh, engagement with the supply chain to actually trigger those new supply chain capacity investments here in the UK I think when we look across the, the kind of GB energy policy and regulatory framework, actually over the last kind of 10 to 15 years, we've had a lot of success in deployment of offshore wind and, and phasing out coal. But actually, in terms of capturing that supply chain, we've not gone done as well as we, we could do, mm -hmm. primarily because the frameworks have been put in place that have effectively fragmented our ability to have those early and at scale um, engagements with the supply chain. And I'd maybe point to one area where there has been recent success, um, kind of um, recently as, as, as last week, is on electricity transmission. So um, what happened there is that to meet the kind of government's 2030 offshore wind ambition, uh, a strategic plan was put in place by the electricity system operator, the ESO, that then enabled uh, a kind of a scalable plan for investment for the electri electricity transmission uh, owners, of which we were one in the north of Scotland, which has then, then enabled the supply chain to see that uh, you know, visibility of that pipeline, but also see you know, firm contractable orders that they can actually invest against. And that's why we've kind of seen um, kind of the recent investment from uh, Japanese industrial conglomerate um, Sumitomo in uh, high voltage uh, manufacturing com uh, Kind of uh, capability up at the port of Nick, up in the Scottish Highlands, that will kind of create uh, 300 uh, good, uh, good green jobs. From our, from our side, supply chains have settled down now. We uh, immediately post COVID period, we had big issues with electronic semiconductor availability. That's all calmed right back down now. And so, uh, as I speak today, touch wood, no, no supply chain issues at the moment. And there's definitely constraints. We're coming through a very difficult period since the invasion of Ukraine. But, uh, you know, I, I agree with what Alistair was saying. It's really about opportunity now. And I think maybe we should just remind ourselves that success won't mean us winning in all parts of it. You know, there will be areas where we can get a foothold, where we've got a very strong foundation as a starting point, that's what we should build on, and that, that will be success. We don't have to be in or dominate all parts of all chains. You, you need part of it where you can add value. And I think the other thing is, when, when you're successful, and not, not all of it will work out, <laughs> let's be realistic, we'll, 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 we'll chase more than we actually succeed with, but where it works out, we have to help it through its whole life cycle. So getting a new bit of industry up and running is a challenging phase. It needs help with managing risk. It needs help with managing, getting started, making investments. You know, getting a, a new manufacturing facility up and running is hard work and can take years. And then, what, then it needs sustaining as well. So it's a very dynamic situation, and we need to be ready to be dynamic in response. Mark Palsy. Uh, thank you. Chair. I want to follow up on the um, line of questioning that Douglas Chapman started, and that's the impact of the. Uh, United States IRA and the Green Deal from the EU and the challenge that that faces. And I mean, in many ways, you know, getting the message that this has been something of a game changer. And so my question revolves around uh, how should the UK respond? And uh, Duncan, you sort of spoke about investment in skills, which we've traditionally been pretty 
uh, difficult with we, you know getting uh, apprenticeships underway ha hasn't been brilliant you spoke about a planning system we hear project after project <coughs> going down the planning system so frankly those are not great advantages that we've got um, you were very positive about the investment in ports but I'm wondering if I might ask our other, other, other witnesses what, what, what should we do in the face of this uh, challenge that's uh, posed from the US and uh, and from Europe. So, Carl, can I start with you? What, what would you, what, you know, if you, if you were in government, what, 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 how would you deal with that? How would you respond to that challenge? I think the main, uh, the main issue to focus on from our side is manufacturing is a long-term investment game, uh, and we need, therefore, an industrial strategy that gives us that guidance and that framework to work in on that long-term basis. And uh, particularly in recent times, we've had so many changes in government, changes in officials, and changes to, to those policies. Manufacturing is a long, long-term investment, and we, and we need that long-term thinking. The stability of policy. Correct. OK. Correct. Uh, Duncan, I'll, I've got yours as ports. <laughs> uh, James? Largely with Carl around stability and policy, and I think that stability and policy will encourage that investment and give uh, confidence in establishing um, those industries right. and manufacturing. Do you see any sign of that emerging? Um, so there are clearly, clearly areas of positivity. So we're involved in the Harmon funding rounds, and we can see a really kind of clear hydrogen policy. But that does come with risk if we don't ensure that that support doesn't flow down through the supply chain. We're so not going to make a decision on hydrogen in heating for a Not in heating, no, no, I'm talking about industrial, so that, that, industrial that's, de... That's hardly certainty of policy. So, so from our perspective, though, we're focused on industrial decarbonisation, where we do see a route for hydrogen, less so for domestic. Um, but that's just one area I can see there is government support that is working with a uh, comparison to Europe, where so you see... strong, strong uh, you know, uh, 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 route... From government, correct. And if you if you look at the current strike price for hydrogen, the H1 round versus Europe, we've come in at a higher price, which will encourage or give us likely success of more projects than we may see uh, across in Europe. Okay, and Alistair, how, how, how should we respond? Um, so I think you know um, made that first point around you know embedding strategic energy infrastructure, and making sure the policy and regulatory uh, framework aligns with that. Addressing delivery barriers, I think planning um, and consenting is. is creating all sorts of delays and issues for infrastructure yeah. projects and remove overhanging uncertainty that are um, kind of uh, okay. feeding into investments. And can I ask you, what, what are we good at? What are our strengths in this area? And why would people invest here? And are there areas where we've missed out on investment? And what might we do to, to deal with that? So, for example, we have heard about you know, our, our uh, equivocal approach to onshore wind. So we, you know, we haven't invested in onshore wind. But what, 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 what are we good at? Where are our strengths? So I think, you know, we're talking purely technologies. I think there are opportunities in floating offshore wind, um, high voltage direct current cabling, um, and CCS and hydrogen. Um, and kind of focusing on those four, and in particular the, the components and manufacturing parts of that sector are going to be pretty important for delivering those, and where we have comparative advantage will be an important thing to do. But I'd also echo the point around the service economy. It's not just about you know, jobs here in London that are servicing the, kind of the green transition. Actually, there's a lot of jobs in the central belt in Scotland around uh, the kind of renewables industry, be it in finance or kind of, uh, legal professions, that are going to be critical for delivering So leaning into those, but I would say those are the four technologies that I would um, call out as particularly important. And James, I have a question to you, and I was going to respond to the point that we're brilliant at developing new ideas, but not always br brilliant at seeing that through to volume manufacture. Um, what, what else can we be good at? How can we, how can we really seize the opportunities here? So, so, I, I agree in terms of technologies, um, and I think it is a challenge that the UK has faced in terms of bringing those through to that volume manufacturing stage. And I think my point earlier about investment in areas where we have that comparative advantage in the supply chain, I think it was Duncan that made the point that we don't need all of the supply chain, we need part of that supply chain. So that technology-led manufacturing or component parts of each technology, whether that's CC, CCUS, whether that's hydrogen, will deliver strength and that's where I think we can gain some competitive advantage. I think finally if we look at solar, so we have a, a very strong capability to design, build and install solar, but we don't own or we don't deliver much of that supply chain apart from labour in the UK. And that's an example where perhaps you know, something has got away because there wasn't early enough investment in the UK to create that supply chain. Why didn't that early investment take place? Mm. I, I, to be honest, I suspect that was probably down to policy uncertainty, 
you know, a, hard, a large number of broader distractions in the economy at the time that meant that actually the rest of the world accelerated. Some of that was also down to raw material availability for the panels themselves, but clearly mounting structures and other capabilities could be formed within the UK. And Duncan, your assessment yeah, of strength of weaknesses, UK and challenges. I would recommend actually the offshore wind, the, the industrial growth plan that was recently published by the Offshore Wind Industry Council together with Crown Estate Scotland, Crown Estate and, and Renewable UK. They really did a <coughs> item by item analysis of where we have the capacity, the capability, the starting point and made those selections. They made five recommendations. It does include some of the smart stuff, smart in the operations phase, you know, some of the turbine components like blades and, and cables. But actually, it's an item by item analysis. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a roadmap for targeting our efforts. Yeah. And you told us about the sector deal. Did that help? And is it still helping now? Does it need revising? Does it need updating? We're in a, we're in a new, new world here. We, we, we're just entering a totally different phase. We talked about the IRA and, and just the scale of it globally now. It, it's just. It's, absolutely it's, we ballooning. forget about the sector deal. No, it, 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 it's, it's something to build on. And I think this IGP does build on that. Okay, and, and Carl, your uh, Just a couple of comments. We're, you've already said it. We're really good at innovation, yeah. transforming that innovation into then industrial. That's been a long term industrial lo- problem in the UK, hasn't it? It has, it We're has. But change that overnight, are we? But with hydrogen, we had that. We took a very early lead. Uh, we were showing that innovation. Those opportunities are starting to, uh, to diminish now. We, but there's still an opportunity if we take some key decisions based on this long term thinking there's still an opportunity for us to show some leadership. Other countries are starting to catch up. And may I ask you as a manufacturer of boilers, do you see an opportunity for hydrogen in the domestic heating area? We see it's a multi-technology approach, so hydrogen has a part role to play in domestic heating, we believe, alongside other technologies. Okay, thank you. Thanks, I'm just going to take a moment to play a quick game now. So uh, I'm going to give you £960 million, and I've... I'm trying to get to net zero by 2050, uh, and I'd like you to tell me how you're going to spend that 960 million. Just give me a sense of how you would cut the pie up in order to help me maximise investment and general progress towards my goal. Carl, do you want to start? Thanks for coming to me first. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've partially said it just. This is... Uh, a multi-technology approach. This challenge yeah. is not favouring one technology or another. We've got to develop and move forward with that multi-technology approach mm. and take uh, and apply some long-term thinking. And I think the part that um, we sometimes don't talk about around decarbonisation challenges is the energy, energy security element of mm. what we need to achieve. And, and when you then think about that as we move forward, it takes you down that multi-technology approach because it's too risky to put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, so I should be investing in a portfolio of Absolutely. technology. Yeah. And yeah. how much should I be spending on skills, do you think? Of, of, of my sort of large billion pound pie, how much should I be putting into A this? good chunk of it, probably 25%, 30%. Yeah, interesting. Okay, Duncan. And another 25 or 30%, I think you could invest really targeting a small number of high profile do, 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 do you agree that about a quarter is going on skills yes. then yeah interesting okay yes. yeah yes and a, a similar amount i think in attracting it probably a relatively small number of, of high profile anchor investments in new manufacturing it's going to need cultivating over a period of time it's going to need developers and investors in in energy assets working with the manufacturers over a period of time helping them future proof the investments they're going to make helping them de-risk that so national government local government local authorities the suppliers and the buyers have all got roles to play over an extended period of time yeah. and and I think you know we we know it's competitive yeah. so you know it's not going to be free to mm. attract in some some really big anchor investments but but we can do it and we should we should once we can anchor some of those i think a lot more will follow very useful and, that, and those are firms right those are kind of anchor firms yes yeah. that's clusters you end up with clusters yeah to, James. Um, it's probably gone a third, a third, a third. So I think you have a third on, I think you call it high profile projects, but where there's investment through the supply chain, I think the point I would make there is that it doesn't stop at developer level. 
and that it moves through the contracting chain because you need those lower parts of the supply chain to have traction and to see reward and benefit rather than just accepting risk. Um, I think part of that, the, the second third, would be investing directly in that manufacturing, so supporting UK supply chain. And that might be that actually accepting that we have to pay more for UK supply chain uh, in support of specific projects. And so when we are looking at assessment criteria, um, value for money may take a different meaning when we look at the proportion of UK supply chain. Mm-hmm. And then the final third, kind of clearly in skills, so developing skills in the right areas um, for us to support that transition. You would put la- local labour market content quite high conditions. Uh, yes, absolutely, and but, but and I think that but there, there needs to be a, a, a glide path to get to that point because if today that was the criteria for certain projects, yeah. you wouldn't be able to, to meet it. Yeah, that's done. Um, so I've, I think kind of the comments that have been made I kind of largely agree with them, but I suppose maybe to counteract the kind of perception of what we may be asking for. So you know, I work for an offshore wind developer, electricity networks provider. But I would suggest that we kind of put more of the pots that we have available for manufacturing into things like CCS and hydrogen because they need more of a kickstart than those other sectors do. But it's about how do you make sure that you leverage in all of the opportunities from offshore wind um, in electricity networks through the other routes that you have available to you through those kind of stable investable kind of frameworks to make sure you get your, your biggest bang for your buck. You know, we're not here saying we need taxpayer money, money to do this, this and this. Actually, we need to do our fair share of the kind of uh, skills development. What we're asking for is that longer term certainty that we can then invest in our skills pipeline to deliver on our investment plans going forward. Very useful. Julie Marson. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, particularly on supply chains, but we've got such a good range of sectors here. I want to make sure that everyone has drawn out, that we've really drawn out what you consider to be the key constraints and um, vulnerabilities, if you like, in your sector-specific supply chains. So without going over ground that we've already grown, can I go down the line and make sure that we we understand that in the supply chain from your industry? Looking across electricity electricity system, and and Duncan will be looking at offshore wind, a kind of component of that, I think it's making sure that policy and regulation can enable us to have early and at scale engagements with the supply chain to trigger that supply chain uh, investment capacity here in the UK. Okay, thank you. I think we we occupy a slightly different part in supply chain because we are physically delivering a lot of these projects on the ground. So I think the point that I would raise is around that risk flow down. So as an EPC contractor, we don't always benefit from that top level investment and funding, but we are asked to carry the risk of success of delivery of a project. And so ensuring that that support is there throughout the supply chain to make sure that there are roles and organisations there that want to deliver innovative technologies is important. Okay, thank you. Duncan? Um, I, I, think, I think it's been said, the framework of stable reg- regulation creates a, a, a risk environment where you can make those investments and our, these investments can be partly growth of what we've already got, we have got s- stuff and it also partly needs to be attract new new players in our marketplace and and so um, I think we've talked about it, 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 it it's, it's the platform, people, infrastructure, the business environment and, and then the physical infrastructure as well. Thank you. Carl? Well, you guys have already said most of it. From, from my point of view, again, it's this long-term perspective and this multi-technology approach because we're dealing with the product that goes into consumers' homes um, and we've become so reliant upon one fuel vector, one fuel type, we need to take a much more multi-technology and multi-vector approach as we go through the next uh, couple of decades on this transition towards a net zero journey. Thank you. And to what extent is the UK overly reliant um, on a single country for products, for components, um, materials? I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, we look at Xinjiang, for example, 35% of polysilicon comes from Xinjiang with its obvious concerns about forced labour. To what extent is that a really key um, issue for the UK sourcing those components. Master, um, uh, maybe start. And, um, so again, I'll go back to that point I made around there is a, a kind of tight supply chain 
um, there will be kind of challenges to um, compete for that available supply chain and how do we then focus on um, encouraging kind of the onshoring of that supply chain mm. capacity as, as and when we can um, is going to be important but I think in terms of delivery of the projects that we're kind of involved in um, we're um, kind of will be competing in the same um, space for a, for a number of those components where um, we may may maybe not be able to scale but where we have been able to um, kind of secure supply chain capacity that's come from kind of the re you know the real world um, kind of realities of you know what does the supply chain uh, kind of contractor want from a company like SSC it's they want a long pipeline of projects that they can kind of invest against themselves rather than are you going to order a couple of turbines for you know three years time or and, and actually are you going to order any more it's actually how do you move from ordering 300 or 250 turbines in three years time to how are you going to place an order for 100 turbines a year for the next 10 years that's how mm. you kind of hook in um, supply chain investment here in the UK. And to what extent in your sector for example can is there a capacity to reuse recycle uh, components and, and product in your supply chains? Yeah, I mean it's going to be a really important part of what yeah. we do but and and Kind of the wind industry is doing a lot of um, work at kind of circular economy to make sure that kind of the turbines that we install are able to be kind of properly recycled. I think maybe Duncan might be a bit a little bit close to that, but it's going to be critical that we what we're installing is not only kind of you know have the circularity built in at the start. Yeah. But actually, a, a key point of what we're considering in terms of how we deploy infrastructure is making sure that our impact on the environment and on communities is a kind of positive uh, net benefit to them that we're not coming in um, and kind of putting infrastructure in at the sake of the communities but doing it with their consent and kind of sharing the kind of benefits with them. Right. Same question to you James really. Yeah. I think you, you kind of referenced the, the, the one area silica where there is a kind of a, a very narrow market but actually IRA we are starting to see in America now some, some solar supply chain developing um, so I, I don't think there's anything specific I draw out apart from what Alice was saying about that investment I think that the challenge is that where you see that concentration of supply chain is where you see value for money so you know, solar panels from China are the cheapest available on the market and that procurement decision comes back to how we value procurement and value for money at the start to make sure that we are broadening that and also giving opportunity for long-term certainty for scale and investment and a large number of uh, equipment whether it's solar panels turbines electrolyzers thank you duncan carl if there's anything you'd like to add i think as an investor and as a buyer um, we always want to see a vibrant competitive multi-party supply chain that we can tap into Today we have some areas where there's a bit too much concentration, we've, we've, but, but the bigger issue is that we've got loads of areas where there just isn't enough capacity. So, I, you know, I think actually we're at a special moment in time when the world's changing and, and we need a major investment. So I think it's that more than concentration, I would say. And, <coughs> um, yeah, and the, the circularity just emphasised that. Obviously, a lot of energy assets are very long-term assets, so... The phase we're seeing now with exponential growth in some new technologies, it will be in 20 or 30 years' time when we see the growth in volume of the, of the circular element. But, for example, in a wind turbine, you know, 85% plus can be of the steel and copper, you know, eminently recyclable and valuable to do so when it, when it comes to it. Great. Thank you. Carl? Not much to add, really. Sustainability is a, a really big topic. Um, we're lucky from a supply chain point of view, we're part of a big multinational group, um, but actually some of that sustainability starts to question whether we start to onshore some more activity with the, with the precise target of reducing carbon emissions throughout the whole supply chain. Uh, so those are some of the areas we're looking at at the moment. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just a very quick one, really, because we're, I'm going back to skills again, which we talked about earlier on. So I can see this working between big business to big business. I can understand that. But the majority of this kind of work that we do, heating systems and that kind of thing currently, is with small businesses, very often one-man bands and that kind of thing. And we'll need to be able to rely on those people uh, in order to ramp this thing up. So, um, Carl, I think I've been on one of your seminars about 18 months ago where you were talking about Worcester, Bosch, um, setting out uh, apprenticeships and training of individual uh, heating suppliers, for example. Is that the kind of thing you could ramp up and, and scale across the country? Yeah, and that's what we're planning to do from an um, uh, electrification of heat point of view. 
So we've, we've got five or six training centres around the country. We train 25,000 installers every year on our equipment. So we're well set up. It's been part of our DNA for 20, 30 years. Now we're transitioning that to training them on, on electrification of heat, on heat pumps. But actually, it's getting that timing right. Uh, because the upskilling they, they need is more on the, electri the electrical side, not necessarily on, on the heating and the heating system design side. Uh, but the timing issue is because most of them have got very little demand at the moment for that type of uh, uh, product, that type of work. Mm -hmm. So we're training them. Yeah. And then they don't they don't use those skills for quite some considerable time. Exactly. So we're then going round loops of it? retraining and retraining. Yeah. Absolutely, chicken and egg, and yet we've still got to get to twenty fifty with all these people transitioning. So Correct. Yeah. Very very difficult. What's SSC doing about this? Um, sorry, in terms of uh, reskilling. Uh, yes. Work. So um, we we do a lot of kind of direct training um, from apprentices um, through to kind of graduates into the company. I mean, um, you know, actually our investment program to deliver on it is going to need people. We're employing um, you know, a thousand people a year um, to our kind of 12,000 people workforce entirely to deliver on our kind of investment plans going forward. But in terms of making sure that we can kind of contribute to the, the wider ecosystem, um, we've kind of put in place a pretty robust um, just transition um, strategy with the first energy company to do so in 20, uh, 2020. It's about kind of, you know, how do you phase people into these kind of new low carbon uh, opportunities, but then also how do you kind of ensure there's a kind of pathway out of the high carbon activities. And actually in terms of, maybe I'll excuse one example around CCS and hydrogen, Actually, there was a, kind of a couple of years ago. There was a lot of focus about, you know, what are you going to do with um, the, you know, the gas power stations that remain on the system and are there to kind of keep um, kind of the lights on. Actually, we, we took a kind of clear decision to say that actually we are kind of, you know, we could move on that as asset to private equity quite happily um, from their perspective. But actually, we we saw ourselves as the best owner of that asset to be able to transition um, those uh, those important sites for um, communities around the country. Um, and you know our power CCS projects and our hydrogen power projects are going to be critical linchpins for the deployment of CCS and hydrogen infrastructure within the UK's industrial clusters. So, in terms of um, reskilling uh, and reskilling and ensuring there's a kind of transition plan for um, kind of people in communities, you know it's at the heart of what we try to do. And I can share our just transition uh, strategy with the committee um, in a bit more detail. Yes, please. Thank you, James Duncan. Anything else you'd like to add at all? Uh, no, I think as Equus, as we, we have 600 uh, apprentices across our 15,000 employees, and where we operate, for example, in Birmingham, across the shared uh, the SHDF funding for retrofit of social housing, we use local supply chain wherever possible. So we see it as, as our role as a strategic supplier to government to invest in skills, not only for our own organisation, but also in the environments which we work. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, I I suppose I, I would just say that you know we're an example of retraining ourselves. You know we were a high carbon energy company, coal and oil and gas, and we have spent a number of years both converting ourselves to a, to clean and also retraining our workforces. And we're now, of course, developing bespoke apprentice programs, bespoke partnerships with education institutions and other partners. And I think particularly where we find we're we haven't got the scale in a particular discipline. We're also now starting to twin up with others who are in the same position so that we together build enough scale to do a programme together. OK, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. This has been an extremely useful session. Um, let me just wrap up by asking you all um, one question which came up in our earlier panel, which is we had the head of the ABI. She's helping steward a group of investors that are looking after all of our pensions. Um, they're committed to spending about 100 billion, investing 100 billion over the next 10 years. Um, but one of the big problems is just the lack of projects coming through in the project pipeline. Now, you've all highlighted problems around that long-term demand curve, skills, planning, skills, skills, skills. <laughs> we'll come back to that quite a lot. But just give us a top line on why those projects are not coming forward at quite the pace that might meet the investment appetite. Alistair, do you want to start? So firstly, on electricity transmission, they are. A lot of progress being uh, made in deploying the electricity transmission grid yeah. um, out to 2035. On offshore wind, we've hit uh, a number of uh, road bumps um, in the sense of we've had a failed uh, auction 
um, the parameters for the upcoming auction um, are um, unambitious, let's say, maybe. Um, and actually, we don't have a clear plan about what we're going to do for the next few auctions. You know, so we're at AR6 now, but after the election, it'll be AR7, AR8, AR9, which will be the ones that are going to be critical for does the UK meet its uh, 2030 offshore wind target? Mm -hmm. And on CCS and hydrogen, um, we've basically had slow progress in kind of... Uh, Kind of support frameworks to actually deploy the infrastructure which companies like SSC are going to need to connect into. Useful, thank you, James. Um, so, I think building on that, I think so, planning the challenge. So, I take so to start with, so it's the ability to get projects through to get consent quickly. I think then also we take hydrogen, it's the alignment of funding with the real world project delivery. Um, so that I alluded to earlier, which is where you're forced to make commitments in terms of cost before you fully understand design in order to get your funding. So I think it's alignment of government intervention with real project delivery and enabling consent to happen quickly. Yeah, so for that bit of the investment that is in infrastructure that will produce energy, um, we've got the tools and the frameworks we've got We've got the contracts, the long-term contracts. We've got allocation rounds. We've got the regulatory ecosystem. So, as <coughs> Alistair says, it's about making it clear and ambitious enough and foreseeable enough to drive that. And then I think most of the rest of our discussion today has been about the other bit, which is in the supply chain side, the industry side, that will support that, that infrastructure. So I think we've covered that. Yeah. Uh, certainty. Um, we, compared to uh, my colleagues here, we're at the end of the supply chain, so they supply the stuff to the house, we burn it, we uh, transform it into heat. Um, and there is so, so much uncertainty about what that future energy system looks like. We just need that medium, long-term certainty so we can all make those uh, investments. Mm. Uh, and that's, it's been lacking for the last 10 years and it continues to lack now. So it sounds like from across the board, actually, policy haze is the kind of number yeah. one problem that is getting in the way of investable projects. Right. Thank you very much indeed. That's been a brilliant session. The committee is very grateful to you for your evidence. Feel free to submit anything further to us um, as we draw up our conclusions about what the industrial strategy for the UK's transition to net zero should look like. But for now, that concludes this panel and this session. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.